Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with New York-based jazz singer, composer, lyricist, and musician, Sasha Dobson. We caught up with her to talk about her latest 2022 CD called Girl Talk. It is a venture that she felt a burning desire to make, and she explains. She's originally from Santa Cruz, California. She performed all across the world as both a leader and first call collaborator. The stylistic chameleon has released projects with her friend Nora Jones and is composed with Bill Murray and open for Will. Willie Nelson and toured with Neil Young. She comes from a musical family and jazz is woven into her DNA from her father, pianist Smith Dobson, and mother Gail, who is also a singer. She's got a great story. She's full of passion. Dig this. Hopefully this interview will make uh, make hairdressing much easier for you. So thanks for taking a minute out. Oh, no problem. I'm just, I'm just getting my day going here. I'll I hear you. So, you know, I guess the, the, the thing about Girl Talk and about putting out new material right now is this is an inordinately strange time on planet Earth since March <laughs> of 2020, you to put it, it lightly. <laughs> so what I want to know is there has to be a level of relief, I would think, with artists that are releasing material right now because we're clearly on the other end of this thing. And hopefully things open up as as the months go on here. So how does it feel overall to have this release out right now? Thanks for asking. I, you know, I just had the thought today, oddly enough, um, about an hour ago in the bathtub. <laughs> um, I need. I thought I need to step back and look at the whole year from this point, from this day to a year ago, and you know, pat myself on the back a little for doing anything, which oddly enough, I think because a lot of people were so hungry to work and a lot of people I might not otherwise have been able to like collaborate with because a lot of people would normally be on the road. It's just, I kind of left out between the music videos and the record. The point is, is that, you know, it's been such a struggle for so, for everyone on, on one level or another. And for me, you know, even though the pandemic may be on, on its tail end, like you say, it's so daunting to be an artist and think, how am I going to survive? Because even if we can be together, we humans can be in the same room eventually. At what point am I going to be able to survive off of playing live shows? Because it, it's just totally overwhelming. The point is, is that um, I feel really glad that I got something uh, done, you know, it feels great. But because I'm not on tour, because I'm not knee deep in gigs like I normally am, um, it's a little confusing day to day, you know. <laughs> Sorry yeah, for yeah. that long answer. You're probably going to focus me here and there. <laughs> no, it's fine. And I guess that's kind of, I mean, it's kind of a larger narrative of questions. I'm an artist. I'm gonna ask. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's jazz. Work with it's me. improv. Right. I, I get to it. interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Believe me, I, I my my background's Italian. We're stepping all over each other all the time. You know, the one thing too is during this time of self reflection, we've all learned things about ourselves. What did you learn about yourself that maybe you didn't realize before this that's gonna in turn make you stronger as we reemerge into the world? Well, you know, when I move, I live in the Rockaways, which is sort of like an alternative lifestyle for a New Yorker. It's um, like at the very edge of Queens, um, like on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. So I'm about 15 miles from the city. I have a car. And I moved out here four years ago because I thought if I don't get away from the city and I don't take a little bit of space from gigging every night, I'm never going to get any writing done. And I know that writing is sort of my lifeline. And so I moved out here, got a bigger place, all the instruments in the same house, you know, no more practice space. You know, I, I live the California life in New York and have a commute, and I got a ton of writing done. When I moved out here, I thought, I, I just want some space. And so now, after two years out here, and then plus two years of basically quarantine out here during the pandemic, I just have a new appreciation for my friends, for humans, for what I do as a performer, like on a tangible level, especially in person. I just feel like it totally, everything that I left me, the city for to, to gain out here, I want back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Imagine, right. uh, I want to be out, <laughs> you know what I mean? I want to 
I want to sing live. I want to be spontaneous, <laughs> you know. Everything is just so different now. For now, every, you know, I mean, certainly last year, I mean, if, if you think about last year at this time before everyone was vaccinated, it, you know, things are much better, even if they're not totally better. It's, you know, we're, we're like you say, we're, you know, we're, we're working our way forward here. But yeah, it's every day is a, a is a is a mountain, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, totally. And this thing is undulated too. It's like you know, after the first wave of vaccines, things opened up a little bit, and then mm-hmm. even this fall, things opened up. It's like it's gone back and forth, and you know, no one can keep up. Our conception totally. of time's off, you know. So, but I yeah. think what you're saying too is, which is interesting, which I think kind of mimics humanity right, right now, is that probably what we all learned since this all shut down is that we need people more than ever. The community of oh, humans and Definitely. more heartbeats. Yeah, you know, it's Definitely. pretty essential. Absolutely. So. I can't wait to get back out there for real, especially on tour. I mean, I, I can't even foresee myself going on tour for another year. I mean, that's if everything goes well, because even if we hear about famous people doing shows now and again, no one's going on big tours. It's just not happening, you know? Yeah. It's a it's a urban legend. People keep posting these schedules of tours that they end up canceling. And yeah, okay, we're going to keep generating like the possibility of things happening, so people keep buying tickets, and so we can keep planning and thinking ahead and staying optimistic. But ultimately, no one's on the road, right? Yeah. You know, so we have to get creative. And it's just had us it's had us all stretch stretch ourselves outside of our limitations of what we thought we were. <laughs> you know, the thing about girl talk is that. I had this huge growth spurt after I moved to the Rockaways and started writing a ton. And everything I'd set out to do kind of happened, which was great. As soon as I started hustling and writing a lot, you know, Nora and and Nora, who's my writing confidant, you know, hey, I got some new songs, you want to check them out? Sure, I'll check yours out, you check mine out, you know. And then, you know, that's when our album, uh, second album, Sister, came about, you know, she she said, well, yeah, maybe we should talk about putting together another record. You've got some new songs. You know, I know Kat's got a couple of songs. i got new songs. You know, so, and that record came out two weeks before lockdown. And then, and so I had made an EP with Don was called, um, what's it called? <laughs> a simple thing. I can't even think that far back. And then I thought, I felt the pull of things happening between Simple Things, the Puss in Boots second record, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to get in the studio and record with my jazz band because this is this whole other side to what I do that no one knows about because I never make the time to record it. I always just hustle all these gigs in New York. My lifeline in New York is playing jazz shows and the world doesn't know about it. They just know that I work with Nora Jones and Puss with put you know, in a band called Puss and Boots and, and it's still like, you know, I, the last write up I got on Girl Talk it was like Sasha Dobson plays in a band called Pleasant Boots and it's like it's it's an honor. I mean, Nora and Catherine are my friends and Nora and I go back twenty years. But it's not what I spend my, my days and nights doing. You know, it's when when she has a little bit of time to spread the love and her musical fan, fabulousness with her other projects, then we get to do that project. But but it's you know, as far as my jazz legacy, you know, growing up in a family of jazz musicians and working on the jazz scene in New York for almost 25 years, it's like I just thought I have to record this band and I'm not doing one more damn thing for any other project until I do this because it just it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And then about a week later, we were locked down. So then after wow. about a month, and, and it's so funny because I've, I've, this is on my press release, this story is all over the place, but it never really gets uh, translated into the media, it, you know, so I'm just going to keep explaining it calmly, but, you know, it's like, um, yeah, so, and then, and the session is live, it's me, Pete Bernstein, Dred Scott on drums was the first session, and Neil Minor on bass, and so the people that floated in a few tracks during the pandemic, remotely, was the vocal tracks for Nora on Girl Talk, uh, my brother's vibraphone tracks where he played um, vibes on Time on My Hands and perhaps um, and one other, I think, softly. And then I had Stephen Bernstein put some horns, at, you know, and also Ian Hendrickson Smith. And then the, uh, and then the final person who contributed to the album, who was this phenomenal percussionist, um, Mauro Hefosco who is like works with everyone out here. Um, and but the but the core 
of the of the album was live. Um, and we managed, I just looked out, you know, I just, I had this strong inclination of, to make a jazz record because I never have, which is crazy if you know me. <laughs> and because this is what I do. And when I'm not working on guitar and slugging it out trying to write new songs, I'm singing jazz. And, you know, that's what I do most of the time. It's just not, for some reason, it, nobody knows. I mean, I... Now that I have the album out and you can stop me at any time, I mean, I will say though, growing up on the jazz scene and having lost, you know, had, had tragedy in my family, my mentor and my dad, you know, he died young and tragically and, and he was, you know, our, the top of the pyramid for us in what we do in, in my family. Um, everyone in my family is a jazz musician. So, I kind of remember why I left the jazz scene because, you know, it's small and very clicky <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting falling back in on a on, on on the public eye because I've always, on the scene, talk to anyone in New York, they all know who I am. I've been on the scene working with so many great jazz musicians the whole time I've lived out here. And even before that, you know, when I moved out here, people knew me because they knew who my dad was, you know. and. And that's because he's great. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm great. I'm just saying that, you know, I had it lucky moving to New York because people already knew who my father was. And um, a little bit of, you know, information on the, on the project because nobody knows, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It gets, you know, it gets lost in the mix of things, you know. Somebody has to do a write-up on 15 jazz records that they don't really want to listen to and then, you get two lines that of information that don't add up, you know. Um, but I understand. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not so frustrated. As, right, right, right. <laughs> well, you know, these modern times. What are you going to do? You know. So I guess the one thing I want to know yes. with this album is, what do you ultimately want the listener to get from this experience? Well, on a personal level, the joy that I get from singing jazz is about the same as the joy that I get from finishing a song and which is, you know, a lot. And also it's kind of like an energetic pull. Like I didn't start singing jazz because my parents forced me into it because I was just I couldn't I was so sick and tired of being shy about it that I, you know, just I had to do it like every artist eventually admits, you know. I, I don't mean anybody pushed me to do it. It means like there was nothing more than I wanted to do, oddly enough, was to participate, uh, you know, in this music. And when I listen to jazz music, I get so much energy and so much inspiration. And I just thought, I've got to make this record. You know, I want this to be part of my my my, my resume. You know, when people look up my name, I want them to know that, this is also something that I do and that I love. Um, I grew up singing jazz and, and a female growing up singing jazz in, in a world of male instrumentalists predominantly, especially when I was a kid. I mean, the revolution of women playing instruments and taking over and writing music, you know, is only recent. But, it, you know, when I grew up, the boys played instruments and the girls sang. And so, I mean... I've become a songwriter. I've become a guitarist. In this particular record, I, I step back and I just sing jazz, which is kind of what I grew up doing. I guess to answer your question, what do I want the listeners to get? Is hopefully just some joy. Um, it's with a great band, and it's a traditional approach to jazz music. Um, I'm not trying to incorporate country music. I'm not trying to like push my original music in there and turn it into like a mixed bag even though there are two originals they're pretty straight ahead you know especially you're the death of me it, it it's got a standard format so most people don't know that i wrote that song you know because it kind of sounds like a standard um and so the point is is you know my intention was to give an honest interpretation of this music that i grew up with that i absolutely love and contribute to the legacy of, you know, of, of that community, of that culture. So you mentioned your family coming yes. from, a, from a jazz lineage. 
talk to me a little bit. I mean, we all have flashpoints, you know, obviously being in a family of musicians is one thing, but what, what were musicians? What was kind of a flashpoint where you said, this is what I want to do? God. Hmm. I mean, I can think, I was the youngest. And my brother was a bit of a musical prodigy. So I just remember growing up in a, you know, and being, watching my mom and dad and brother on stage. And my entire life was, I mean, our routine as a family, my parents worked at night, you know what I mean? Like uh, all the jazz musicians that my father worked with, Bobby Hutcherson, you know, Tootie Heath, Jeff Chambers, the great late Jeff Chambers, the list goes on and on and on, Red Holloway. They all came to our house to practice, to rehearse, you know. And so I didn't know how unique of an environment it was until I got older. And even then, I didn't really know how unique it was until I got even older. <laughs> you know, like, oh, wow, that must be why I'm a little bit different or why I kind of, like, keep migrating towards musicians, you know, for better or for worse. It's just kind of all I know. I definitely think when I got to my late teens, early 20s, is when I, before my dad died, when I saw him play with Bobby, and I think it might have been I had already moved to New York and came back. I don't know. You know, it's just it wasn't really a conscious thing. It just was something I was super, super already involved in before I even knew, oh, this is what I'm going to do when I grow up. It's just what we did. We worked together. We played music together. Our family, you know, families come together and they eat. Our family came together and we played music. And um, that's kind of still how I am. That's like the the foundation of who I am, like. Even people, even friends of mine who don't play music, I'm always trying to get them to play music <laughs> because that's how I know how to break bread, you know. And then, like, I definitely thought, well, maybe I could do something else because, you know, in our darkest of days, even for those of us where our careers are pretty set in stone, I mean, it's like when you take away the foundation of what you're supposed to do, perform, you know, you start to, you know, you start to go, okay, <laughs> you know. But it just, every time I say that to somebody or a close friend, people are like, you know, what are you nuts? <laughs> You're going right. to be fine. You're going to play music. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. That's what yeah. you're doing. <laughs> you know? Yep. But yeah. So with, and, uh, with, with that in mind, yeah. what do you like the best about being a professional musician? You know, waking up every day, being able to create and, and, and to give people music. What do you like the best about this process? Performing. The one right thing on. I'm not allowed to do. I mean, performing under the right circumstances. I've definitely gotten a little bit more selective in my in my recent years, even though at this point I practically do anything. I mean, I used to do gigs anywhere, anytime, you know, any day, and now I'm a little bit more like, well, presentation matters, you know, and are people seated? <laughs> you know, can people see me? Um, definitely performing is, I, I want to be involved. I also love recording. You know, being in the studio is the opposite experience, but just as intense. Um, writing, I mean, there's all kinds of, <laughs> like, a bunch of different hats, you know. Yeah, um, absolutely. For me, I guess having, the, f the thing about being a professional musician is, at times like this, it's a freaking nightmare, you know, and also, you know, watching my mom get older, who's just a gorgeous woman inside and out, but she is almost, she'll be 80 this year, and she's a phenomenal jazz singer, and she's been on this jazz scene in the Bay Area for 60 years, you know, plus. And, um, but, you know, it, it's tough when there isn't like, oh, retirement plan, and, you know, I mean, I remember the stress level that my dad was under to keep things afloat for the family, and he was a success. Um, but it was so hard. So, you know, that lack of structure in what we do is really challenging. But then the freedom of having time to create your day, to be, you know, to spend the morning writing or spend the evening writing or, you know, there's a lot of different hats, again, to what you do, especially if you don't have a manager and an agent and all these things to do a million different jobs for you, You're, you know, you've got to or you don't have an arranger and a writer, you know. I like to do it all, not so much the booking, 
<laughs> but I like to write. I like to play an instrument. I like to sing. I like to perform. So, you know, a lot. Definitely performing is my favorite. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> can't tell from the sound of my voice. Yeah, no, I get it. I totally get it. Uh, when I was younger, so performing was torture, and, and I was a shy nerd, and I, I was extremely anxiety-inducing, and then I just finally grew up, and it's like the best, most rewarding thing ever to just be calm and be with people and share what you do and... Let and be present with musicians live and or or with people and just let things be, you know. Yeah, yeah. Magical. <laughs> yeah, and I get it. I'm tired of social media because even though it's a way to stay in touch and to connect and to share, it's like enough about this. <laughs> you know, I yeah. mean, it's, there's the one thing that it's lacking. Unless you're doing a live stream that's truly live and not fake live, <laughs> is yeah. you know. There's something about being with your people, with other people in the moment that's, a, you know, the thing that we're all missing right now yeah. more than ever. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to, everything's going to come down to this. Okay. Everyone has, a, everyone has a perception or an idea of who they think you are, your family, your friends, oh your fans. But you live your life. You have a perception of you. Who do you yeah. think you are? <laughs> How the heck am I supposed to answer that? I have this sort of like, personality that I fall into because I'm generally pretty excited when I get to be around um, the girls Puss in Boots. So I get silly and extroverted. And and then when I step away from that, sometimes I get a little bummed because I have so much more going on in my heart and in my mind um, than what I get to funnel through that band. So then I, then I do the jazz thing and then there's, I wouldn't say there's so much heaviness, but there's so much there. It, almost too much at times. Unless you're a jazz musician, I think it's hard for people to fully, a non-jazz listener, it might be like, whoa, this is too much for me or too heady or too, I don't know. I, you know, I just know that I have compassion for people who don't know or listen to jazz. You know, I don't expect everyone to love it, you know. Um, my goal would be to hopefully introduce jazz to non-jazz listeners and maybe help them, like, love it, you know, by by being honest and maybe clear. I definitely think, you know, as an, I personally, as a personal, like as the mother of Sasha, me being myself, you know, meaning not the actual mother of Sasha, but I mean me being my own mom, you know, my own guide. Um, I grew up being so scared to try new things and I wanted more than anything my entire childhood to be, you know, like an inch. I wanted to play an instrument. I wanted to write music and I was so afraid because I had all these like virtuosic musicians around me who were so good that I just didn't know how to begin. And now I wouldn't say I'm the greatest writer or anything, but just doing what you love and trying new things um, that for me is the type of person I want to be and see myself as, you know, when I'm not belittling myself <laughs> like most artists do, you know, or human, you know, we all have good days and bad days, but I mean, I see myself as somebody who's a bit of a chameleon um, with, you know, a jazz singer and a lyricist, a songwriter. Yeah. That's perfect. That's a great answer. Sasha, thank okay. you for taking a minute out for Neon <laughs> sure. Jazz. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate you opening up, and good luck Thank with everything. You. Thank you, you too. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest singers and players in California, New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Sasha for her time, honesty, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com, and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.